But don't make us turn off the stream again, okay? <laughs> um, the good news is, is I found an awesome story while we were down that oh, I'm great. so... Was... Well, that's great. Give me one second to reset this thing here. Boop. Okay, that's going. All right. Well, let's uh, let's try again. Let's just go in hot. All right. All right. Let's do it. Let's start the show. We're take two in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Adrian Mean, joined by Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hello, friends. So uh, Brian's doing Brian stuff. He'll be back next week with, uh, you know, more Brian. So, you know, there's not enough Brian in this world. We need more Brian. So we'll get sure. more Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, gentlemen, I had one story, which I'll talk about in a moment. But, man, uh, while we're getting ready to launch, <laughs> didn't mean to use that term, but I found a story that relates that's kind of pretty awesome. Um, you know, we talk a lot about... SpaceX because you know SpaceX is doing really really cool things and then we talk about you know uh Blue Origin a little bit Jeff Bezos's company mm -hmm. which is you know uh kind of you know kind of awesome too Blue Origin's the one that did the new Shepard vehicle which is a rocket that went up to the Kármán line then came back down they haven't built anything that's gone orbital yet but there are plans they're building their new rocket the new Glenn named for John Glenn new Shepard was those rocket naming conventions come from Alan Shepard was the first American astronaut to go into space, which is when he went up, came back down. John Glenn, the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth. So their next rocket, which will be orbital class, is the new Glenn. They're in full development on this, which similar to SpaceX's like Falcon 9. They'll have two stages. They'll go up and go do this. They've built their own powerful rocket engines for this. They're also going to be building, you know, maybe building rocket engines for like, I think, ULA, whatnot. Very exciting stuff going on at Blue Origin. And SpaceX has been getting the news because they're kind of – Kind of got the head start here, or been you know, or in the lead, but Blue Origin's not to be discounted, particularly when the richest man in the world is bankrolling this. Yeah. But there's another company which we've talked a little bit about before, which there are other a lot of contenders, but they're the big contenders, the ones where you know money's not going to be a problem, that they're not going to run out of funding next year or whatever. The third contender we've talked about is Strato Launch. Strato Launch is the company started by Paul Allen. Paul Allen's one of the Microsoft billionaires. It's like, you know, 46 richest man. Mm -hmm. $46. He's an extremely wealthy guy. Fun. What's that? Oh, uh, you, you cut out the 46 oh, yeah. most richest man. Hello? Oops, cut out again. So I'm still here. Um. Fudge. Uh, okay. Uh, well, this is embarrassing. This never happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna watch I swear this never happens. Wanna watch a movie? <laughs> um, we can try going audio only. If, if, the, uh, but yeah, is it my end the problem or no? Because it's both of you guys on my end oh. going out at okay. the same time. Because right. I'm also, and I don't know whether or not this is just a new Skype thing, I'm getting a poor connection alert on my screen. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking at my at my router now, and it, it should not be mine. I'm getting a fairly clean 300 down, so. Um, I'm actually not getting as fast as I normally get for a fiber. For line. the, like, for the, for the kajillion symmetrical that you guys normally get right um but i don't know we yeah, if you, if you think going sound that's fine I, I i unfortunately have that out so um yeah l let's just try to do that for now uh um, okay i'm i'm gonna kill the send feed to both of you guys if you can do the same sure so matuba says it looks and sounds good here but uh uh the problem is that uh, we're getting these hiccups and it's destroying the conversation. Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, let, let's try this. So you were saying Paul Allen, the forty sixth richest man in the world. Yeah, Paul Allen, who is a space enthusiast, science fiction enthusiast, among many things. Um, you know, created that awesome museum in Washington. 
his company, Strata Launch, came out with a very interesting approach, which was he said, we're going to go build like the largest airplane in the world, and we're going to use that as our launch platform. And the reason he wanted to use an airplane is that if you launch a rocket high enough, a high enough altitude, you can reduce the amount of fuel you need considerably. Now, the SpaceX approach and the Blue Origin approach is like, well, let's use a booster, use the booster to take that upper stage pretty high, and then the upper stage can go take off. And then what Paul Allen wants to do is one of the first ways we actually tried launching our first vehicles to go into space were actually like, you know, the uh, uh, some of the experimental rocket planes, which were launched from other planes. So they've built this humongous plane we've seen before, which is this, you know, uh, gigantic, you know, gigantic craft. And then uh, it's not the technical name for it. Um, but anyhow, the plan originally was when they first announced it, said, hey, we're going to make a deal with uh, SpaceX. We're actually going to try to launch a Falcon 9. That fell apart because I think in part because SpaceX and maybe realized that logistically trying to build a Falcon 9 capable of launching from a space from an airplane maybe was a technical thing they didn't want to have to worry about at that point. So then they went on their own approach, figured out other things they were going to do, how they were going to, what vehicles they were going to launch, made agreements with other partners, et cetera. Well, today, Strato Launch has announced, hey, and there have been rumors they've been working on their own vehicles. They announced they have a, a whole fleet of launch vehicles that they're going to be building from what they have is they have existing vehicles like the Pegasus, which is a very small rocket, which is you know launched from a, a plane. They say they're going to be building a medium launch vehicle, their own rocket, which will be capable of carrying about 7,000 pounds. Uh, they expect the first flight in 2022. And then they want to have a, uh, a medium launch vehicle heavy, which could do about 12,000, 13,000 pounds into, into, you know, which is not huge compared to what say like you know falcon 9 does right now but it's still really good for payloads etc it's still a really good launch vehicle for a lot of commercial applications mm -hmm. but then the rumor they'd been talking about there was a rumor about something called black ice that that they were working on black ice that it might be a space plane they've confirmed that they are building their own space plane which is basically Ooh. something that looks like if you go to the website at Strata Launch, which is cool, you have to scroll up because, hey, space to see things. Uh, <laughs> you can take a look at this uh, very cool, looks like a, I can't, you know, an X-15 in a space shuttle had a baby. Yeah, I, I can't tell if – are you talking about the, the, the one that it, – it looks like – it would be a plane, but it has two main cabins instead of, you know, one fuselage, right? That's the launcher. That's the vehicle that takes oh. them up, and that's what they launch from. Oh, wow. Okay, so then it's attached, I guess, in the center here because yeah. they, they do have some other renderings. Like, this this one looks like a looks like the shuttle, looks like the space shuttle. Yeah, like in that, yeah, it looks kind of like a next generation. It's got the heat tiles underneath and the white on top, but, like, two fins in the back, et cetera. So... That is the space plane that they say that they, they're looking at this thing to be able to do medium class payloads and maybe crew, you know, and they're still in a design study. So, I, you know, that's a far off thing. But at least they're coming out and saying, this is what we want to do. This is where we're trying to head. So, so where, where, where is the timeline on stuff like this? They list here like they don't have a timeline for that. Like their 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 own launch vehicle that they want to build uh, for like the heavy the the one that's going to start doing um like they're the Pegasus, they're looking at 2020. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they're looking at the medium launch. Or the one that has a substantially larger payload, 2022, and then there aren't dates for the other ones. Wow. So what is what what are the advantages of a you know an an aircraft launch versus like a rocket launch? I mean, I guess you save on having you know huge boosters and huge um you know fuel fuel tanks but that you what you get out of this is that now understand when strata launch first started it was not clear at all that reusable boosters was going to work that was a thing that there, there we weren't clear that reusable boosters were going to work and so this was a different bet this was a bet that paul allen was making that I think that we're better off using a spacecraft. I mean, you having a spacecraft launch from a high, ginormous high altitude airplane. Mm -hmm. And now we're realizing, well, you know, reusable boosters are a way to go. But the advantage with this is that you can you can aim this in any direction and you can kind of put your payloads into many different kinds of orbits with, you know, your fuel requirements are, you know, uh, less in some cases. Yeah. 
because if you want to put something east west west east polar, polar polar orbit whatever you're not as you can you don't have to launch this thing from a uh, you can launch rear rockets basically from runways you don't have to go build you know or have to use you know cape canaveral or vandenberg whatever oh, yeah. so it increases the availability of places to launch from mm -hmm. which is a big advantage Cost wise, your first stage, if it's an airplane, you're using, you know, Jet A, you're using airplane fuel for that, which means well, it's the same way as like a booster works, but you're not using, you know, liquid oxygen and hydrogen or whatever. So you have an advantage there. Now, you don't, you have to have your rocket has to have more power than an upper stage of, let's say, like a SpaceX or Blue Origin rocket because it's not getting as high. Yeah. But there are certain advantages to their uh, rapid ability to, you know, launch. You know, you could probably. Put one of these things on to a hang in a, on an airplane in a hangar and get this thing. Your launch readiness is faster, so there are certain advantages to this, you know. And it's it's you're, you have a payload limit though, you know, to it, sure. and you know their their timeline, you know, twenty twenty two for their medium launch. That's going to be around the time that we're hoping. Best case scenarios, the BF, the Big Falcon rocket, which is SpaceX next vehicle, which they're building, which will be the fully reusable monster you know, starts flying, but, you know, I think more bets are better. Well, and I think that's, that's when, when, when we talk about how radically different space is going to be in the future, that's really what we're talking about. If you want to get mm -hmm. into nuts and bolts is not only the trajectory of the companies that are flying now, but assuming that they progress and there are new players because any space that has the financial, capability that exploring an entirely new frontier specifically one that is as uh, you know the, the possibilities are kind of endless like what space is uh will have people following now that there's a blueprint of how to do it mm -hmm. yeah and, and what's there's gonna be if let's say let's assume that spacex is successful with the big falcon rocket and they're get they're able to hit that seven million ten million dollar range for what they want to say it'll cost a launch which is ridiculous ridiculously cheap i mean that's like hiring a commercial airplane you know to fly around your friends around the world is you know that's that's approaching that cost right there but let's say that's successful you're still looking at seven to ten million dollars every time you want to launch the bfr which in, in today's space age is super super cheap but if you're trying to do experiments or satellite payloads whatever that still can be expensive for what could be capable. And what Strata Launch is going to be able to offer, in theory, is even cheaper, much, much, much cheaper with cheaper vehicles. And these things might be a, a fully expendable rocket, might be a million dollars, but you can put your payload into orbit. So there's going to be opportunities out there that, that SpaceX are going to say, that's not, you know, we're not going to try to go after that market because it's not a part that we want to go after. And where Strata Launch can say, hey, we can do these smaller payloads. There's a lot of military stuff, too. That's one of the things that... Whenever you read a proposal for anything that's proposed about space, launching space, it is a message, one, to people who are launching satellites currently, you know, telecommunications companies, et cetera, governments and military. And they're, they're often these requirements are very specific to what military payloads may meet, need. And I've seen that a lot with some of the SpaceX stuff. You'll hear them, we're going to be able to do this. Then you'll read like Air Force is talking about looking for something that can do X and you find out, well, well, SpaceX has clearly positioned themselves to do that. Same with Blue Origin. Mm -hmm. oh. wow. Exciting times. Exciting times. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Space no, plane. totally. Space plane. And also, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that we can, we can talk about uh, uh, you know, uh, other, not only another company, but also just a mm -hmm. full other way to interact with space. Right. A completely different mechanism to send payloads up. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I don't know how useful this will be for much larger payloads. I don't, I don't know, but I know that they're really smart people working at Strata Launch, and they've got a very smart guy who's backing them. And yeah. I encourage, you know, and it's like Blue Origin. It's like, you know, I, I, I wear my SpaceX t-shirts almost every day, but I'm, you know, I want Blue Origin to succeed. You know, I want these, I want these visionaries to build a bigger future. You know, it's, it's, it's. I live in a world where, where Google, Apple. You know, Netflix, they all won. Mm -hmm. And it worked out, and, you know, Android and stuff. And it turned out, worked out pretty cool from where I'm looking. Yeah. Oh, so, absolutely. No, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. And and that's what's fascinating if you project a couple years out is like, okay, well, yeah, uh, there, there's definitely a cap of what they can get up into orbit, but like size wise. But also, it's like, well, how many things below that cap are going to be going up into orbit? 
Like, I think we're going to be looking at a lot of stuff that's, you know, there's, there's, this is going to be a far busier space in five years than it was five years ago. Which brings me to my next story. Okay. Um, what thing we were talking, I was going to talk about before, but this t- timed with that really well. Well, actually, the, here, I'll tell you what, before, before we get into that, let's also remind people that you can back this show at patreon.com slash weird things. Again, patreon.com slash weird things. Make sure that you keep this show rocking and rolling by heading on over there right now, kicking in a few dollars. You get your own RSS feed, get to the after things show quicker than uh, you would otherwise. So, uh, please thank you, uh, for, for, for doing it. If you already done it and please consider doing it if you haven't yet. Thank you. Patreon.com slash weird things. So, uh, George Dvorsky over at Gizmodo has, uh, made a declaration. He says, Hey artists, stop putting shiny crap into space. Now, remember we talked about the orbital, uh, there was the, the mirror ball, which was launched by, uh, I think rocket lab. Um, they put that into orbit to show, Hey, we can put things into orbit now too, which, uh, you know, people were critical of this. They had the humanity star, which orbited and finally deorbited. And, um, there were some criticisms of it and, you know, and people said, Hey, it could interfere with astronomical observations. I'm not aware that it actually did. But there was this, oh, it's going to interfere with astronomy. Like, maybe it will. Maybe it will. I don't know. But I don't know that it did. I thought it was – I wasn't exactly thinking that it was the most inspired stunt. But I understand exactly why Rocket Lab did it was people knew who a Rocket Lab was and they knew that they could put things into orbit. So it was a brilliant kind of move was like, we're upset that you're doing this thing. And you had, they had certain scientists and astronomers were very upset by this because like, hey, you're putting this thing into space and it can interfere. But I know like when, I said, like – when When the Rocket that? Lab went, went – when the rocket lab one went up, I I did not know that it was being done by an, another rocket company. I just thought this mm-hmm. was some dude sending this kind of yeah. dumb statement up. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's sort of kind of how a lot of some part of the me- me- uh, people in the media have, handle it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, Gizmodo had covered that before and they talked about it and they had, you know, an astrophysicist, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. You know, uh, John McDowell said it's the space equivalent of somebody put a neon advertising billboard right outside your bedroom window. Um, I mean, I mean, your bedroom window. It's very um, tiny. It's a very tiny. <laughs> yeah, neon and, sign. and I, I don't, know, I, I don't know that it that it interfered with anything, and I didn't hear a lot of follow up saying that it did. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But it, the the people who were upset that this was going to happen tended seem to have dropped the story after it came back down Mm -hmm. without finding out if it did cause problems. And that was something like, well, I don't know. But anyhow, we've got a new uh, art installation project, and this is the Orbital Reflector, the brainchild of U.S. artist Trevor Paglin. And basically what it is, it's going to go up on a CubeSat, and once it's it's unfurled and fully erect, the space-based sculpture will be visible in the night sky appearing as a fast-moving bright star. It will stay in low Earth orbit for a minimum of 60 days, though it could be longer. Yeah, it might be like 72 days. It's low Earth orbit. It's in a degrading orbit, unless the laws of physics radically change. Well, you know, I'm sure it's <laughs> not going to stay up there. Um, but uh, Dvorsky is very upset about this, says that we need to stop putting shiny stuff into the space and talk to some other astronomers who totally agree. And, uh, you know, it is a it is a. You know, cause for concern among many people of, you know, these artists putting these shiny objects into space. And this is done as part of an art project of the Nevada Museum of Art. I mean, I guess it's an issue of scale, right? Like if there's one of these, every, if there were one of these every year, it would be not an issue. But if we extrapolate into a world where, you know, it becomes cheaper and cheaper to put stuff into space, then from a scientific point of view, this could this would mostly just be space junk. Well, okay. Let me let's let's dial it back a little bit. Okay. So, in a world where we were not interacting with space as often as we are, how would we view this? Cuz I have a feeling that we would my sense is that we would view this as oh, eccentric artist does big eccentric artist thing. Mm-hmm. And sure there would be some people that don't like it or think it's unnecessary, and certainly many more that might think it's wasteful, but that's kind of, uh, you know, baseline criticisms of art, right? Uh, As long as it's not doing any harm, I don't know how many people would be mad at it if it weren't 
if, if space weren't more of a reality for us. Now that it is, and things like space junk and even, you know, for, for whatever it's worth, you know, space force is something that we talk about. They're, these are just realities on levels that they hadn't been previously. I, I wonder, you know, where this kind of griping a is coming from and B who's listening to this and saying, yes, uh, no, 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 uh, none of this stuff, because if it was really hurting something, then that would kind of be the, the headline, right? Well, the, 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 I'll give you the, the closing paragraph, which is okay. uh, from Dvorsky. It's getting easier and cheaper to put objects into orbit, which explains why artists are now using space as their canvas. Rocket companies like SpaceX, Spaceflight Industries, and Rocket Lab stand to profit from ferrying many satellites to orbit, which means they have little incentive to question such endeavors. Given this new era of access, government agencies may need to determine new standards for what gets to go into space and what doesn't. On its own, Paglin's orbital reflector won't pose a problem, but given that it's the second flashy sculpture to go into orbit this year, we may soon see a lot more of these projects. Maintaining a clean, unhindered low-Earth orbit and upholding the needs of science should take precedence over gestures as these. So let me let me unpack this just a little bit. Low-Earth orbit is a very, very large area that goes from basically... You know, arguably, you know, the, the, the lowest point of orbital line is, is actually debatable, but we'll, we'll put it at, you know, 100 miles to about 1,000 or 2,000 miles up. There are many different orbital paths there. CubeSats go into this super low area there, and they can only orbit for a certain amount of time because drag slows them down, and they deorbit, and they break up in the atmosphere, okay? There's that area of LEO, low Earth orbit, and that's where CubeSats generally are launched from. So... It's this treating it like there's this one highway like, oh, well, you know, there's all you know, we can't put too many things up. It's like, yeah, it's, it's more complicated than that. But things do get into paths of other things. Higher or the further up you get into LEO, the more desirable it can be because you can be more there much more stably, have a more stable orbit. Lower the orbits are kind of generally less desirable if you want a long term orbit because it's harder. You need to have your, you know, what's called station keeping. You have to keep fueling the thing, keep moving it. But that's sort of the thing, like, okay, let, you're, you're saying low Earth orbit, but, like, it's kind of like saying the ocean. Like, yeah, we don't want to pollute the ocean, but if somebody wants to put a boat out in the ocean for a while, is that a problem? Well, here they're saying it could be a problem to astronomers. We've heard astronomers go, this could be a problem. We haven't heard an astronomer say this one was a problem. Will we get to a point where putting shiny things into space could be a problem for astronomy? Very much could be. It already is a case where, you know, if you're an astronomer, you know, you got to keep track of the ISS and other shiny objects. There are thousands of satellites up there that do reflect light, and if you know where to look, you see them. In the case of this, you know, it's, it's well, it's one more object, but it's for a purpose we don't agree with. And that's the thing that, like, I'm, I'm not a big fan of art, installation art, and in-your-face art. I'm not a big fan of a lot of this stuff because I think it's kind of BS. I'm not necessarily a fan of this thing. But I'm not going to tell them, hey, you don't have a right to do this. I'm not going to say, hey, listen, I've decided my science is more important than your art. Therefore, you can't do your art. And that's the problem I have here is that mm. I, you know, I, I might feel that, hey, like if, you know, if somebody's doing critical medical technologies, things like this, and it's interfering. And I'm like, yeah, maybe not a good idea. Somebody's making astronomical observations. Those are useful and those are of value to people. But do I have the authority to say Hey, enough of this art crap. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's what it comes down to. My, is, my take is, I do not. It. Yeah, uh, I, I think if if this is something that is interfering with big stuff, then I, I think, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, and this gets into a whole nother conversation, but the, the solution is governments are going to need to decide what can go up into space instead of, I think it's going to be these companies that are deciding, yeah, like, okay, like, we're we're not going to put these things up like this. My sense is that they will continue to send things up as it, you know, as people are paying for these rockets to have them go up. But it's not going to be. I mean, I can't just go up there and say, oh, no, send my space weapon up <laughs> like they're going to say, no, that that's violates it, you know, law. So we can't that they're not just gun runners. Right. And so maybe that will ex uh, extend to large, potentially dangerous or hazardous or distracting art installations. But I don't know if we're there yet. Well, yeah, and I think that it's I think that, you know, the, the Dvorsky sort of thing is, you know, the, the, the comment there is like, well, you know, SpaceX and them, they're, you know. 
It's money. They want to make a buck. It's like, well, they're partners with companies like NASA and other people who are involved in space research. I think they're going to be a little more mindful than, ah, you got you got thousand bucks. Ah, pay me in bills. Put it in a shopping bag. I'll put it into orbit. You know, like, and there may be case. You know, there will be cases where maybe struggling space launch companies may want to do those things, but. I, I think that he just sort of cavalierly sort of was like, well, they don't care. I'm like, no, I think they care because mo they're more invested in this than you are and more invested than some of the people complaining who have yet to demonstrate this has affected them. And I'm well, I, you know, I'm super pro-science. I'm super, super, super pro-science, but I don't want to get in a position where I'm saying, therefore, my my love of discovering things about far off parts of you know our galaxy are more important than your art. You know, I... I I won't make that, you know, I won't make that call, Sure, you know, and say, therefore, you can't do this thing. Yeah. Uh, and like, you know, all oh. these companies are on the razor's edge of being something that will be regulated more by world governments. Like, yeah. so that's something that they're definitely going to have. <laughs> they're going to they're they're going to understand the line. And and uh, I would assume that they will be proactive about enforcing that line uh, as as they go forward, because the last thing they want is another level of governmental bureaucracy, let alone some kind of level of international government bureaucracy about clearing everything they send into space. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it's it's. I think the value of this, like right now, is really cool. I think the value of this is 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 pretty awesome in that, you know, you're it's neat now. And yeah, I think that in a few years' time it will become crass. And as you start doing more stuff like this, that becomes it'll be like, all right, do we really need to do this? It's been done. You know, there was uh remember the Christo uh uh the artist, am I Crisco? Um you know who I'm talking about? Used to do the yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Christo. Uh, so Christo and uh, uh, and I guess his his and John Claude. So he was the guy that like entirely wrapped an island in plastic, right? Hmm. Does these did these really 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 cool things of like creating these huge art pieces, taking existing things and then wrapping them and doing this sort of things. And what he first did them was kind of amazing. You'd see these 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 oh it's is uh uh. I'm trying to uh, – him and his wife, uh, I'm confused, Christo and Jean-Claude. Um, so it is – and again, I'm, I'm being – I remember the name Christo and ignoring that it's a partnership here. So they've like wrapped the Reichstag. They've done some really cool stuff. They did a 24-mile-long thing called the Running Fence in Sonoma and whatnot. But there's been uh, – and Jean-Claude died in uh, 2009. There have been criticisms, growing criticisms of like doing this landscape artwork that like when it first was done, it's kind of cool. But then it's like, all right, we know it's temporary. We know you're making a statement. But really, do we want to throw a bunch of plastic out there in this environment? Do we really want to do that? And again, these things are cleaned up and they're done. But that criticism kind of comes up after a point of like, do we want to keep doing these kinds of things? I mean, and the, I could see. the the question for me is like specific damage, right? Like, if this stuff gets cleaned up or recycled or reused, like that's that seems fine, you know. Um, uh, and so I guess that's kind of how I'm approaching the orbital reflector. Is like, mm -hmm. you know, if it's not leaving this big plastic bag up in in you know in in space as junk, then I don't know. It will be another blip in the sky for what two two and a half months yeah and well the the argument is made is that for astronomers who are trying to do their you know trying to make ops make observations and i'm like I, i'm like and that's it yeah and it, it's you know i'm reading the book by uh timothy Wu, which is about the 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 master switch and they talk about how at&t was able to prevent anybody from doing anything relating to telephones because they could say well there's the threat that you could you know you could electrocute you know our elect you know you could electrocute technicians working a line if you if you put your own telephone on there or if even you put a plastic device hmm. on your phone it's a threat to the system which could kill people and they use that threat to suppress anything that you know any other te telephone technologies because they have a, hey they had a government backed monopoly uh, you had the same thing going on with, you know, Sarnoff and AM radio as they suppressed FM radio. They got the government to, you know, prevent the development of FM radio 
because they realized that FM was a threat to AM stations because, you know, they had a control over AM and you could have other. So it was, you know, these these threats only sort of materialize and become real once you get the government to back you and say, yeah, no, we agree with this sort of threat. And that's the thing here is like we're hearing what can interfere with astronomy, can interfere with astronomy. And is it a territorial thing like, hey, space is for us space people and sciencey people and not art? Is it is it for people doing real legitimate stuff or not? And I mean, Settled. I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah, I, it's it. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I would they love it to instead that he it. was launching a space telescope. Yeah. I'd love this, but I'm not going to be here and be like, you're therefore you're crap. Can't do it, you know. So yeah. Anyhow, uh, I've got to run in a few minutes, but I've got I've got a question for you guys. Okay. Shoot. Um, do you want to buy a hat? Would I like to buy a hat from you? And would you like to buy? This is a new m- movement. Are you getting into Anybody haberdashery? Sorry, you, you guys had a hiccup there. Uh, uh, are we buying a hat from you, Andrew? Are you going to be a merchant of fine chapeaus? I'm. I've got. A, I'm gonna get. I got a hat. I'm. I'm, I'm representing somebody. I'm gonna try to sell this to you. Okay. Um. And uh, what? Uh, I mean, what style of hat is? See it? If anybody wants to buy this hat, I got. I got an auction going here. Um. It's. It's a fur hat. It's kind of like a. Kind of like a. Kind of like one of these sort of a, kind of a Russian, you know, sort of hat. Not like, so not a Jamiroquai. <laughs> Probably not. I don't know what that okay. means, but I'm going to say <laughs> oh, no. Just Google, you remember Jamiroquai. I remember him. I just remember the hat. I just, you know. He wore a hat. He was a big old furry He was top known hat. for his big furry hat. Okay. It's great. Glad that this so, is right, legacy. So not a Jamiroquai, just more of like a a... A kind of like a like a Russian or or Chinese fur hat, like a fur hat. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, we, uh, all right. Is this um, was this hat owned by someone famous? Okay, and and um, you guys are not bidding together. You're competing against each other. Oh, okay. okay. So... Well, number one, I'm going to start the bidding at five dollars because right. uh, Andrew has already purchased for me a fur hat. And it was great. So I am a satisfied customer, and I would like to buy another one. I'm in the market for another fur hat as sold by Andrew Main. I'm in. Bidding begins at five. Well, Finsky, if see, you will. I'm going to hear I'm, your I'm gonna, five I'm, star, five dollar review, and I'm I'm going to say six dollars, Justin. How about that? It's You're so actually glowing a review. more more of a beanie. It's more of a beanie. So actually, I think Justin will look great for you in Oakland. Okay. okay, a fur beanie. A fur beanie. Oh, okay. Fur beanie sounds like the main character on a children's show. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you guys. Okay, so... a photo of this hat. Go ahead. Sure. I'm waiting. I'm gonna... All right. I, and I, 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 I mean, want $6 you to, for a fur beanie right, is just a steal. Five dollars. What will you give me for this price? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go up as far as ten dollars. I mean, a fur oh, beanie. My God. For the record, he he already offered six, and now he's just trying to to gouge me because he knows that I love these fur beanie idea. But you wait know what till I you undeterred. see this one. Wait till you see this one. Okay, I'm in for twenty five dollars. Eat that, Nesh. <laughs> I'm gonna say, tw- I mean twenty five. We're starting to get get. Little, I'm, I'm gonna I'm, tell I'm, you something too. I'm say thirty five. It's one of a kind. One of a kind. Make it thirty six. All right, so you've just text, texted us a an image of the hat. Um, it's going to come with a certificate of authenticity. Who is this gentleman? This looks like a it's sim. A, <laughs> the seller of the hat. Uh, oh, my God. Is this a beanie of his own hair? <gasps> no. Is this a beanie of someone else's hair? All right, Not so so just hair. just so everybody knows, uh, uh, I'm looking now at this man. He is a pale gentleman, an older gentleman. Uh, he's wearing this beanie. He looks bald because the beanie looks fairly form fitting to his skull. Mm-hmm. But uh, and this uh, is a picture taken of a screen. It looks like very natural fiber. <laughs> <laughs> here we've got a uh, we've got it here on screen. No, where where is it? Um. I don't. Uh, so okay, it's a one of a kind. Am I supposed to know this gentleman, Andrew? What I, would I, no? What would make you want to buy this? What would make you want to buy this hat? 
I mean, he looks very creepy. So there's a chance that this is something that I can maybe resell into the macabre marketplace yeah. or on scary I mean, there's got there is a dark secret to this hat. I think we can all agree on on that central premise. Right. For sure. That. Uh, uh, OK, if I was going to buy what I would need. As far as we know, this man has not done anything creepy. OK, well, I, I, I would need to know that the fur of this fur beanie is like. A, a next tier at a medium tier or higher animals fur right like not chinchilla not rabbit like something higher than that higher like give me an example of higher than that <sighs> like maybe mink or uh or something yeah. rare right like a okay uh, uh like a rare a rare furred animal, like a like a, an Arctic fox. Though it's it, the fur rarer than that. Rarer than that. Well, it, it's brown. It's like brown with some some dark spots. So it's probably not a Arctic creature. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know, Justin. What do you what do you think? Is a, a brown furred animal it's going to be something famous or personal that's that's my bet like the he killed the last badger known to man and made a beanie <laughs> out of its fur or if this is like his his family dog oh. that he's like i need to remember uh, spot checkers and and so now i'm gonna wear my spot checkers hat because I, I knitted a hat of its fur it's the spot checkers hat that does not have spots or checkers on it no uh well because yeah, yeah. he's it was a it, it was an, it, it, not a well-named dog <laughs> maybe a fa maybe like a famous bear like a famous circus mm -hmm. animal is that mm, interesting is that getting warmer colder um, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Biocow suggests maybe it's chupacabra hair. Is this guy trying to sell a, mm, interesting. a chupacabra? Oh, uh, cryptid, cryptid hair. I'm going to say that uh, we, we don't doubt the existence of this creature. Well, we, okay. <laughs> well, we have, we're pretty permissive. Right. Like we've found things that we can call the chupacabra before. Is okay. it goblins? Is this goblin hair? Could it be goblins? I'm going to say science does not doubt the existence <laughs> of the source of hair. All right, all right, now that makes a lot uh, more sense. <laughs> yeah, could this be uh, dog hair from a dog that looks like a tiger? No. I'm going to give you another hint. Okay. Um, uh, this article came from the Siberian Times. Oh, from Siberia. Oh. Yeah. What do they? What? Okay, so then maybe it is an Arctic animal. What? What? What do they have up there? I mean, we know they have bears. That's a that's a big thing, right? Russians and bears, but hmm. uh, J.C. Calhoun says maybe it's a wolf. Is it a wolf? Mm -hmm. Nope, nope. And we assume that this guy there's. We assume that he's, the 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 authenticity of the material. We're not nobody's super skeptical of it. We're pretty like it's very likely that this is what it is. He says it is. Are you ready for what this is? Okay. You ready for this? Yes. Yeah. It's an extinct animal. Okay. Woolly mammoth. No. <laughs> so you know they find these <laughs> mammoths like in Siberia periodically, and their entire area is like their mammoth hair is something you can actually buy. So this guy, his story is. Uh, my relative went to a woolly mammoth grave. This is uh, Vladimir Amosov, a 44 builder from uh, Yatusk, says, My relative went to a woolly mammoth graveyard site at Kazakia Village in ust yaniski and Yakushia. He picked up a full plastic bag of woolly mammoth hair and later sold it to me because he needed money. I kept looking at the bag, wondering what to do with the hair, then thought, why not try to make a hat? <laughs> At Yakushio, we make traditional round hats of horse hair, so why not try and use mammoth hair and create something truly unique? He hired a specialist hat maker to crochet the hat in Yakushian style. He also verified to Samoyan Gagarev, director of Yakutia's Mammoth Museum, that this was indeed authentic hair from the extinct beast. Oh my goodness. So this is for real? 
For real. Oh, so I'm looking at another photo from the Siberian Times. It's it, it it this doesn't even look like a very good hat. This looks scratchy and Oh, 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 oh I'm so oh, look it, at you. Uh, it looks old green. Christian Dior over here. <laughs> uh, you know, with all the experience of making hats out of the fur of extinct animals. <laughs> I'm just saying it's it's an it's an unappealing product photo that they've. That oh, they've I'm built. sorry, Tommy Hilfiger. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure that this uh, poor uh, Siberian farmer person uh, really is going to be stung by your fashion criticism <laughs> of the fact that he took woolly mammoth hair and made a hat out of it. Okay, so you get a certificate of authenticity also to. To guarantee that it is real woolly mammoth fur, yeah, you can hang it from the hat like mini pearl. From, you know, you know that way people, if they want to know, like, is it a new hat? Is like, it's it a really? new hat. Well, it's I mean, look, it's old. all it's all fun and games until Kanye is stepping out in it, right? <laughs> so I mean, like, I we, mean, we, we've come yeah. to a point where all fashion is commoditized and everything can be knocked off in a Chinese factory so quickly. Yeah. We need to define. tiers of luxury and i feel like this is it let's let's plant our flag here let's make a deal with what's what's homeboy's first name again uh his first name is vladimir oh. vladimir yeah. let's go let's get vlad on the horn let's talk turkey uh uh this is this is going to be a big deal we want to get this in the hands <gasps> of influencers and celebrities there's going to be all these youtube kids telling uh -huh. Uh, you know, telling their telling fam to smash the subscribe button and ring that bell in their in their new woolly mammoth hat. Uh, so, everyone's gonna want one. So I just this is big deal. I just saw the price tag on this, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, this is I, now. I know I I I put up thirty six American dollars for this hat. Well, but, but it's going for ten thousand dollars. It's going for ten thousand. Yeah, you know, right now, uh, Pharrell is probably looking at his Bitcoin count, whatever, and going like, hmm, you know, yeah, he I'll can, wear that. Yeah, he That's, can, that, that'll make some headlines. He can put this on the big hat. He can have a hat for the big hat. <laughs> oh, my God. It would be a literal hat on a hat. A <laughs> hat on a hat. And it's like the same. Yeah, it, could, it would match, too. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I listen. Remember the Brady Bunch house got sold? And I think this is only a matter of time. All I mean, this is this is one uh, news item away, you know, from you know the the you know one Instagram feed from somebody you know saying, "Hey, oh, check well, out number one." Thing. You you have to assume that either Nicolas Cage has made an offer to buy it, or he has had a fight with his financial advisor about buying. It, yeah, right. <laughs> Like this yeah. is something that 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 Nick Cage. This has Nick Cage written all over it. <laughs> so is we'll it see. is it legal to take the hair of a woolly mammoth? Is this are they protected? I extinct. I, I, I think that you can buy the stuff because well they're not protected, Bryce. They're dead. Well, um, so <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> the Neanderthal Protection League. Well, I guess so. Okay. <laughs> wow. Ugh, no, no use mammoth for. Hair and head. <laughs> uh, hey, gentlemen, I've got to run. Um, it's okay. been a pleasure, and uh, I'll let you continue your bidding war over this hat. <laughs> sure, we'll we'll go do picks while you go off to your uh, all your weird things uh, meetings. Uh, yeah, my pick is uh, go see Mission Impossible Fallout. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bryce, what's up, Justin? Do you got any picks? I have a pick. I just uh, this this. Netflix Netflix does this thing where it comes out with a show and it really wants you to watch that show and so it only shows you that show at the top of your feed for Man, like two they, weeks. Man, they do lean in, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, tr I try to end up watching a lot of different things because, you know, I'm on Cord Killers and we, we try to talk about new stuff. So I ended up last night taking a look at the first episode of Afflicted. Have you seen the, the advertisement for Afflicted? Afflicted. Afflicted. It's no, a, I, I am I am unaware of what afflicted is. It's a docu series um, following seven people who have uh, chronic illnesses that we don't always have uh, scientific basis 
to believe are real or 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 uh, uh, illnesses that we don't have any way to diagnose or have a name for what what these people have so so i feel like this this was a genre of programming that i knew existed i don't know if it still is going on but it seemed like it was the proto true crime like it was like weird, weird document illnesses like like the like I remember watching getting like sucked into it one day where it was like my mystery illness. And it was like one of those like discovery ID or, or, uh, uh, you know, channels that, that now almost exclusively talk about murders. Yeah. Right? Like extended cable, you know, oddities exactly. of the body. Yeah. But, but they were like fairly cheaply made doc, like a docu series where it was primarily interviews with the, person who was dealing with it and then maybe somebody in their extended family a few doctors but it would it would all be built around like so i started vomiting through my ears uh and and uh, so i went to a doctor and the first doctor said i was pregnant and i wasn't and then i went to another doctor and then we did these surgeries and then nothing changed and i kept vomiting mm -hmm. your third act kind of revelation that it it turns out that there's a, a, a goblin in my skull that's sick. And, mm. and so we, we removed it by taking vitamin B. And that was it. So, like, that was, like, a genre of programming. But now you're saying it, it's back in Netflix form. Well, and it, it's – the way it's set up is that, you know, th those – those shows were either like following one person for a very long, like the show was about one person or it would be like illness of the week. Right. Like here's a yeah. very brief story. And this one is like, uh, I guess it's kind of like that, but it is, it is talking about these seven people who have these seven different diseases over seven episodes. So they all have these slightly longer arcs, right? Like there's, there's a woman on, on the first episode that they introduce who has, um, electromagnetic sensitivity, uh, the same thing that Chuck has on Better Call Saul. Um, yeah, and it, and it it starts with like like that that the show starts with like her talking to the camera crew outside of her house of like okay these are the ground rules of my house you need to keep your cell phones in your car and turned off uh, I, you know we have to limit wireless audio this that and the other thing um, and and you know her it seems like her arc is going to be about wanting to move to the um uh the the national radio quiet zone in west virginia where they don't have cell towers or any wireless signals so that she can live without you know the pain of living with electromagnetic sensitivity yeah and so that you know i think on one of those shows that would be maybe too much for an episode of the week but i or an illness sure of the week, yeah but because it's not just about trying because like that mm -hmm. the show that i was talking about would be more like i kept passing out and so yeah. i got diagnosed for low blood blood pressure and then that didn't do anything and then they thought that i was having a stroke and that didn't do anything and, uh, so and then she finds out the end of that episode is or that show is and i have electromagnetic sensitivity but this is no 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 i have a debilitating disease i'm a human and I how do i live with journey. it yeah right and and I think I think that's what what separates it is that it is rather artfully well put together, uh, and it also, you know, the first episode does not really pull punches of like getting interviews with internists and and doctors to say, well, we don't really have any way to prove that electromagnetic sensitivity is a real thing. We don't have a name for this chronic fatigue sy sy uh, a syndrome that this that this young boy has. This experimental treatment that this one woman is going for to deal with her acute sensitivity to fungus uh is has never been shown to work for any scientific purpose at all um it, like it is very upfront with like hey let's not get too crazy with saying that this is a thing that you the viewer may also yeah, have let, let's let's not get too crazy and understand that some of these people just might be crazy um and and i i think that's like enough of a netting to say oh i can empathize with you and believe you that you are having an issue even if maybe it's not this exact thing or if it's this thing, this thing that we don't understand you know uh the one of the the young man in, in the first episode um is you know he over this period of six months just 
it, uh, came over this chronic fatigue sy syndrome where, you know, slowly his entire body just became increasingly weak to uh, 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 to light and sound and movement and, and his muscles. And so he's, he spent, you know, two years in his bedroom with, with uh, you know, a, a caretaker and, and his mother because it hurts to do anything. Um, I, I think that there are ways that that could be fake, but I also think that there are ways that it's a very real thing and it's a thing that we might not understand about the human body or, or the human, you know, central nervous system or what have you. Um, but they're very story focused and, and I don't know. It, it, I, I'm, I, I'm excited to look into the other six episodes of this because I don't know how you finish telling these stories. These people, I'm sure, are not cured in any way. Well, I think that's the fascinating part of it, is that there is a very human element to any kind of conversation that you might have with friends or family where it, it doesn't even have to be medical, right? It can just be a thing that they're going through or a, an explanation for something that's in their lives. And to a certain extent, you have a responsibility to say, okay, well, is this real or are you just kind of being weird, right? Mm -hmm. But then after a certain point, there is a, a very human, relatable, almost universal kind of moment where you're like, well, look, in my heart of hearts, I don't have to believe it, but this is just what it is for them. And these are the most extreme outer cases of those situations where now, like, medically you're like okay well i guess we're trying to prove that you're not a liar but also you're obviously in pain so there's probably something wrong uh, so whatever yeah if you need to be in a woodland in west virginia then let's just do it yeah and and um you know i in just googling to find the imdb page for afflicted like the other sort of issue with this story being on this platform is that like these people are have lives and some of them are on social media and, and so like there there's uh, some medium post the truth behind netflix is afflicted and and uh you know whether that's just you know the documentary subject feeling like they were not portrayed right or were told one thing and were were shown the other thing um Wow, this actually looks like it might be uh, a lot of the people who are on the show. Um, you know, <laughs> that's that that's also another facet of it is like, well, what's what even is the real story or a, a different story? And how does that intersect with? Well, you know, if if, 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 if there's a weird unspoken trust element that that it, it's hard to call it trust because they don't need me to trust them and I don't need to them to trust me necessarily yeah but uh it, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to say we're going to make a documentary about a th about things that doctors don't always even believe exists well but that's also just that because there's an actual organic question that you don't have to gin up uh, sorry say that again the persistent question is that, that, that there's a persistent question in the documentary that does not have to be ginned up, that doesn't have to be produced, quote unquote, right, to make sure that there's a conflict. Because no matter what, you can make it about will Betty get to the McDonald's without puking because she has an, you know, an allergy to red. Um, and that can be where you end your story. But no matter what, the audience is not only wondering whether or not she'll do it, but they're wondering whether or not she's faking. And we're watching these people, even if we do have sympathy for them, we're kind of still watching them and saying, hmm, but if she were a liar, how would she act? Right. Or or you, you can get someone who is, you know, over, you know, overly confident and, and says, oh, that well that's just this other thing you just need to go do exactly this other thing that's just lupus you, yeah right which you know these people do go to see doctors and they they are you know have tried to get prognosis i it's 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 an interesting conversation and 
um, I, I just sort of fell into it uh, less than 24 hours ago. So Well, and that's, that's it. that is another thing. is And so much of medicine and dealing with doctors is just grasping for straws in the dark. You know, uh, uh, even but we think of it as, you know, like programming, you know, or like, oh, OK, well, I, I can just edit this code and, and then hit publish. And there we go. Now we're fixed. But it's like medicine is still. It's it's still like could be this. Right. Could be this other thing. Yeah. You know, and, and so there are probably more of these cases than we realize but we don't think about it because by and large, if you're able bodied, then you kind of think like, oh, no, I get sick. I take a pill. I get better. Yeah. Boom. How hard is it? And and I, I think, you know, one last facet of this is, you know, the woman uh, who was introduced of, as having electromagnetic sensitivity, one of the she's showing, you know, everyone around the house and the various things that they do to, you know, accommodate for, for her condition. And she has plugged into these walls these um uh, I, I don't remember the exact name but the like dirty electricity cleaners basically and i had never heard of that that the idea of like dirty electricity is a weird uh it's it's a, a you, you would have heard about it if this was a thing apparently the issue of like oh well you're the electrical current coming to your house is not a perfect sine wave and so you plug this into your wall and it cleans up the distortion and corruption. Uh, and so I was trying to Google it and find out what this was. And it seems like there are plenty of cottage industries waiting to enable and 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 profit off of, you know, these people's, uh, you know, Oh my God, body or bodily reaction to these things. And like, it was very difficult for me to find like, a something that wasn't trying to sell me something to clean the dirty electricity or to you know yeah some, like, like you can't you can't look and find a thing like here's the scientific explanation of dirty energy it's right. always like here's the scientific explanation and buy link yeah you know and purchase link or and, and you know nowadays with with the way seo massaging is it's like blogs or things that look like realistic scientific things saying oh well you know dirty electricity is believed to be a thing and you're reading it and it looks it looks semi-official but you're 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 skeptical and then you see like a misspelling in all this text and you're like okay so this is definitely probably not real at all uh it's and so there are there are outside forces trying to enable and amplify and profit off of these people's plight um and and that all folds into this so, absolutely uh that's that's afflicted uh what, what do you got justin man nothing as cool as that uh <laughs> my continuing research into the 1960 election has brought me to the seminal work of that era it is often referred to in pretty much everything else that i've read about it it is theodore white's the making of the president i am blown away that this does not have an audiobook because the <laughs> prose He's so floral yeah. and would it would be something that would be amazing to be read by the right person. But look, it is uh, the uh, very significant for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, Theodore White had tremendous access to the Kennedy campaign. Uh, it is significant in that not only do you kind of get a, a view from the inside, but also that it was very much historically it is pointed to as a moment when, you know, maybe the press got too close to a politician. Right. And and mm -hmm. how much narrative not only meant means in politics now, but meant specifically for the Kennedys uh, when we talk about Camelot and, and, and how much the Kennedy family to this day. I mean, remember the uh, one of the answers to the State of the Union last year or this year i forget i guess it was this year uh was a kennedy right like that's yeah. how much this family still means to america but there's uh just such an amazing it just it, it uh, also this was the first book that was in that genre that also still goes today of the this was the story of the campaign books 
Those didn't exist until the making of the president. Right. Uh, and then he did three more after that. But that whole genre was invented by this book. And it shows you kind of how it's evolved. Because, again, the the prose here, just out of this world. Like, yeah. it is a writer's book. Uh, in that, you know, the epilogue talks about, in such such rapturous terms, how America elects its president and how it it wakes up early in in the uh, you know in in the small town of New Hampshire where they vote at midnight uh, and then it gets very democratic on the East Coast but then the conservative swell begins as the Midwest and West begin to you know, report their precincts and how much that this is not really a dramatic occasion because at the end of the day, we know the res- theoretically the results are known to our collective intelligence, but because of time zones, we we have this back and forth seemingly. Uh, there's there's stuff that I wish I actually had my Kindle with me so I could just read back some of the great lines. But my favorite, which I'm going to butcher, sure, uh, is that there has never been a direct democracy as chaotic as America's that has worked as well as America's, that most of Western Europe uh, and the settled uh, parts of America, and by the way, there are a lot of things in this book that it's like, man, it's written in 1960. We've grown a lot since then. <laughs> uh, but that there, uh, there's no, uh, no, no direct democracy like America, and that America's has proven, to, though chaotic, uh, to be very effective. In fact, mm-hmm. he points out that there has been only one country that has tried to mimic the direct election of a leader like America modeling on our system that was Weimar Republic of Germany, and they got Hitler from it. (laughs) And we got Lincoln. (laughs) That is like a a, a pairing of sentences is they got a Hitler, we got Lincoln. (laughs) And so it is very much a story told from a very pro-American point of view for our international listeners uh, but it is fairly amazing. I'm still reading it now, but it is worth it if you are a history nerd, uh, uh, without a doubt. So uh, The Making of the President by Theodore White. And this is the 1960 book. This is the 1960. This is the OG. It, w- it wound up becoming much like episode, f- you know, Star Wars eventually became episode four, A New Hope. Uh, <laughs> this was the original The Making of the President, uh, and then... They, he, he did. He did, I think, three or four more successive in that as that one became very popular. Yeah. Uh, uh, he wound up doing more. I have only read about a quarter of, of the first one. Very cool. Uh, well, for uh, Andrew Main and Brian Rushwood, who are both not here and for Justin Robert Young, uh, uh, it's been good getting weird with you guys. Uh, and it's been weird. How about that? Well. Made it through that one by the skin <laughs> of our teeth, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta, I don't have to t- spend some time looking at the studio. Uh, I'm gonna say we skip out on after things. Uh, week. well, I'm going, I was good, I'm glad that you said it because I was going to tell you it because I have DTNS in five minutes. So, oh, Jesus. Uh, okay, well, go, go do that, go and, yeah. and do that. We'll say goodbye to everybody else here. Thank you, everybody, for checking out the show. Uh, uh, we got Cord Killers coming up in three hours? Wow, okay. In about three hours. Um, uh, and then... And then I think that'll be it for, for the day. Uh, we're going to attack tomorrow. And... Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, I hope you guys have a rest, good rest of your Monday afternoon. We'll see you later. Bye!